A very good evening and welcome to tonight's edition of uh, On the Record. My name is Vuyam Vogo and I'm your host. Well, here's what we have in store for you this evening. It would be very good if uh, we, we have succession have younger people coming in and so on and uh, I think it would really be driven by what sense of comfort members of the ANC have. And if they're comfortable with you, you would take that opportunity? If they said so, if they said, well, we want you to continue, it's fine. We dig deep into our archives to bring you this 10-year-old material, find out why. And in our interview slot, Kosato's present on what could be the cause of the biggest strike in this election year. Lies are not going to help us out of the situation. Well, first to our top stories. Now, well, today, uh, Higher Education Minister Blade and Zimande held a meeting, a marathon meeting with the leaders of uh, university students. They were there to thresh out um, the problems that are facing the tertiary education sector um, right now as uh, we speak. Several universities have been caught in a web of violence and intimidation as uh, students are emphatic about their demand of a no fee tertiary education this year and uh, beyond. Now let's take a look at uh, what actually happened. Here's a report prepared by Stefana Koman. President Jacob Zuma exercising his executive powers in a bid to tackle the tertiary education funding impasse. The president says the decision to establish a commission of inquiry follows last October's meeting with university management and student bodies. Coinciding with the announcement, student leaders held talks with the Minister of Higher Education. As SRCs, we're saying ours is not to render these institutions ungovernable. We're just merely asking for our demands to be met in order for every academically qualifying and deserving student to enter institutions of higher learning and education. We are now also introducing a new campaign called Hashtag Access Must Rise which speaks to ensuring that every student has, 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 has assistance in registering and in settling into the institutions of higher learning. They went into the meeting with a list of demands, chief among them that free education must be a reality in South Africa. Before I say anything about NSFAS, I want the public to understand that it can never at any point be a substitute for free education. We are saying that all students who qualify for NSFAS and who are academically deserving must be able to register using NSFAS. And equally so, we've got a category that um, even the department doesn't recognize, which is the working class category. We want them to give us a clear direction as to who is deemed or who can be defined as poor and who can, def who can be defined as rich. Education authorities say they are doing all they can to meet the financial needs of the students that for 2013, 14, 15, debt owed for those three academic years is going to be paid. Meanwhile, on campuses it was pretty much a mixed bag today, with registrations proceeding smoothly on some. Registrations are set to continue throughout the week. Since Tuesday up until today, you can see that the queues are long, people are waiting to register. Uh, we also have significant amounts of people registering online as well as telephonically. Um, we believe that uh, the, the small protest on Monday did have some impact on registration, but uh, we believe that we've made up for it uh, throughout this week. Students at the University of the Free State are threatening to shut down the institution by Monday should management fail to meet their demands. The students are divided over whether to embark on protest action. The Crimes Council met on Wednesday and we collectively decided that it would not be in the best interest of our students to protest at this moment in time. The students to register by Monday and we're not playing. If we did indeed fund every student out of the university's very limited resources, the lights won't stay on. It's as simple as that. I wouldn't be able to pay the salaries of my staff. Uh, the library won't get new books. At UCT, the fees must fall protesters have described the deployment of additional security officials as intimidating. 
security has been beefed up on some campuses amid the writing of deferred exams and ahead of this year's registration process. As much as we do allow the right to protest, and that is an, a right that we uphold, we also need to ensure that at the same time our campus community, that is the students, the staff members, feel safe and are able to continue with the normal programs of the university. Students at Stellenbosch University also have the same concerns. According to the University of the Western Cape, increased security hasn't been necessary. Masaku Komane, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, students clearly not um, backing off. We'll, of course, continue to monitor that story as we have been doing all of uh, this week. Well, on Sunday, I had a sit down with uh, President Jacob Zuma where he addressed some of the issues that uh, Minister Nzimande and the students were discussing today. Of course, the question of financing higher education and the demands currently being made by those students all over South Africa re received this response. I think as South Africans, we've got to deal with the real situation. We can't be... Uh, <clears throat> almost like a utopian about situation because everything we do we need money <clears throat> democracy itself is an expensive system it's a good system expensive system time consuming and we've got to appreciate that because if we don't appreciate it then we could run into trouble you see for an example if we believe that for us to gain anything we must bend the country I think that is not right. Uh, you, you might move to influence the kind of authority to say don't ban the country. A and that means tension. I think we have got to appreciate that in so far as the, free, the, 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 the fees that must be free, government has started long before in terms of at the lower classes. There are fee school, uh, free fee schools today. And you can't do it overnight. And we are headed to start there because that's where the problems are of the poor students who at times, during the, before there was a fee school, they could not even reach matric. And we've got it to deal with that. It's an important task of the government that anyone, including the students, should appreciate. Now, to come to the tertiary area wherein the, the fees are rising, and, and we are dealing with that, we are talking to the tertiary institutions. But also, if we are to have a free education, I think we have got to appreciate that we in the ANC, for an example, we have not started thinking today about free education. In 1955 already, we took a position that a, a democratic government will have to deal with it. But we define it. You are dealing with the students who are coming from the poor kind of houses or homesteads. You cannot say when you don't have all the resources at your disposal, everybody else, even those who can afford, it must just be free. You are in fact participating in excluding the poor students because they are now going to fight on smaller kind of uh, resources that are there. So what we have done is to say, how do we find money to begin a process? The Minister of uh, Education, Higher Education, for an example, had summoned or uh, <clears throat> established a committee that was looking at free education type of thing. It can't just be blanket. It has to look into some realities. Well, I said earlier, we'll of course be monitoring that story, um, looking at the developments, but also in particular the agreements that were reached earlier today in that meeting between the, fin the uh, higher education ministry and the students from SRCs across the country. On to another developing story now. Well, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon has defended the government's new law which will prevent workers from taking their pension fund and provident fund contributions as a cash lump sum 
on retirement. Now, President Zuma signed the taxation laws amendment bill into law last week, and the move has angered Labor Federation Kosatu. Earlier, I spoke to Kosatu President Stumo Ramini on just how this matter um, affects them and what it is that they will be doing in the event their argument doesn't win the day and their demands are not met. I started by asking him whether, in fact, they were not missing the point, as uh, certainly from uh, the explanation that is being given by the government, if anything, this is a good move meant to ensure that workers do get into the habit, an essential habit, that is, of actually saving. The reality of the matter is that a law has been uh, passed on the eve of uh, Christmas, on the 24th of December, as it is the trend that the difficult laws will be pushed through during the December holidays. It was uh, 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 signed by the president and on the 8th it was gazetted without taking into consideration the issues Kosatu wanted to raise with Treasury over this matter. This has been a trend. So, so no amount of propaganda, no amount of uh, trying to explain that there was consultation will be equal to the fact that there was consultation. There was no consultation on this matter. Well, had you been given that chance, um, what would you have raised with Treasury? The starting point here is, this is the workers' money. It's not the government's money. Workers have a right to express a view no matter uh, uh, what that view is, they have so a right a to. It's a principal issue that was denied. Two, uh, if government felt that uh, they needed to help us to learn how to save for our pensions, we did have a right to speak to that matter. But more so, dishonest in the sense that two years ago, this matter is raised at Nedlake. They are rushing to push this law by 2013. And we said, and we list the concerns we were having. We are not happy if the law is passed through under the circumstances. We agree on a, a period of putting the matter in abeyance to deal with the issues. Klantlanen came with his delegation at Kosatu House. That's where we agreed that let's put a two-year period. He went to Parliament. Parliament said one year. We said, okay, fine. What is the program that we must work on, which would include roadshows to members to assure workers that government had no intention of nationalizing their pensions. It never happened. Instead, we had to quell off fires of more than 83,000 public servants resigning because they wanted to cash up their pensions, some using the notion that government wants to uh, uh, prevent them from accessing their money. But here is the real issue. Workers who are under the provident funds, who are largely the lowly paid workers, now and again, have been going to the Pens Provident Fund, taking a portion to take that child to school, to the university, taking a portion to uh, deal with the bank that wants to repossess the house. Our argument is that they had a right to decide whether they still want to do that or not. It can't be the government deciding on their behalf. Now, the law is in. But if you read the statement of government and the presidency today, they say, but you can still access all of your money. That's what they are saying today. You can still take all of your money if you want to take it and use it elsewhere, but you must learn how to use it, save it. Whilst on the other side, fund administrators, your big ones, I can name them if you want to, but where your provident fund is right now, when you go there today and you say you want to withdraw a portion or the total of it, they will say no. The law that kicks in on the 1st of March does not allow you to cash in your money. So we are not going to give you that. That is the challenge we are facing right now. Lies are not going to help us out of the situation. 
Now, this lying, um, arrogant and uh, not consulting government happens to be your political ally. It, it gives us a problem when an ANC-led government, which is expected to listen to the people on this matter, choose not to listen and ignore the fact that we needed to be consulted over this matter. So where to from here? We have a Congress uh, mandate. You were there at our Congress. On this matter, the Congress said the, the Central Executive Committee should observe how the process was going, should government goes ahead and pass the law without addressing these issues, we should apply for a Section 77 at Nedlek and, and build towards a mass action, a strike in this instance. What does this mean for, like in the broader context of alliance politics with an election um, looming? It puts a strain on the alliance relations, no doubt about that. We are uh, already beginning to talk to our alliance partners to say to them, hey, let's solve this matter. The timing is wrong. The, the, the issue is very badly managed by government and it's unacceptable. What happens if uh, the ANC takes sides and uh, supports the government's position? It has always been the trend. They would obviously uh, want to say they stand by the government's decision. But then we all must deal with the consequence of that. And I don't think any part, anybody wants that right now. We will no doubt be following that story as well to see for there are quite a number of implications. Not only a big strike um, could be on the cards, but also it has uh, implications for uh, the tripartite alliances, politics in what is an uh, election year. Well, time now to take a quick break. And after the break, we look at uh, some of the stories, uh, the utterances that were made by the sitting president of the country, but also by one former president uh, of the country, and ask the question, do their utterances or the utterances they made this week um, really uh, carry anything that may just in one way or the other affect the body politic in our country this year and, of course, beyond? That's after this short ad break. Mancosa, Southern Africa's leading distance learning institution. Accredited, affordable, and accessible management education programs. Higher certificates, diplomas, undergraduate, and postgraduate degrees. Register at Mancosa and be part of Southern Africa's leading private business school. Visit our website, mancosa.co.za. Mancosa, management education reimagined. Makamelo Sukunze, one strong woman who said no to hunger. She never allowed circumstances to pull her down. At daybreak, she is up and running in the streets of Johannesburg to make her living. After 12 hours of hard work, she goes back home being able to put food on the table. Join me, Bule Mulebati, on your show about those who take on and conquer life challenges every Saturday at half past five. Well, we look at the events of the past week now and ask whether they really uh, are, are telling us anything about the future 
of uh, our politics in this country over the next year and uh, maybe even beyond that. I want to start uh, at uh, the weekend where the removal of Ntlantla uh, Nene from office and the cabinet reshuffle that followed raised a lot of debate questioning the decision and aligning it with the rapid decline of the rent that followed um, President Jacob Zuma's announcement. Well, I had a discussion, I had a an interview with uh, President Jacob Zuma at uh, the weekend and asked him about uh, this uh, very matter. And what came out of that interview was rather interesting. This was a shocker to people because they're comfortable. They're comfortable that everything moves in a particular way. Um, but they, 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 no one has ever, and I'm not, not because uh, I, I'm volunteering to give the reasons. No one has ever worried uh, themselves to say, but what was the issue? Why did you do so? It isn't very funny that here is a person well qualified financially, more than those that have occupied that position before. Uh, <clears throat> what, for an example, people didn't realize is that the rent, for an example, had started going down when Nene was there. The fact that it went down because Nene was not there is not true. It was going down whilst Nene was there. And there were reasons why Nene had to move. Because we, had, we have a, a, a BRICS region that has to be run. And it needs an experienced, reliable person. And I'm sure if we took, <clears throat> because that is absolutely a new area to work on. If you took, if no matter how qualified the person is, it was not uh, on already a running uh, department, you, you took that kind of a person compared, comparing that person to Nene, people would say, but what is Zuma doing? Taking a fellow who was just working the finance committees, even if he's qualified, what is he going to do? Nene is known, Nene has interacted with international finances, and that bank is an international bank. That's where he's going to be moving. So it was important that that decision is taken. What then do you do with the <clears throat> department? Now, I didn't think a person who has never been there cannot run it. Ministers who have been there before had never run the department before of that nature. But they went and they ran the department. They became perfect. Uh Nene himself started in other departments and moved to finance and finally became the minister. So I, I, I think this, it was, there was an exaggeration. It was an exaggeration which was unfortunate uh, that that was, was taken. And, 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 and in any case, I've never come across a period wherein people say the markets are happy. They're always unhappy markets. I think one the, of the differ, issues, differs in degrees. Really. I think one of the key issues, Mr. President, was that um, as a direct result of what happened, uh, South African assets lost a great deal of value. Of course, it, it happens. Not the first time. <clears throat> the, the, the economic, uh, uh, what you call, uh, meltdown, a lot of uh, capital was lost in South Africa. A lot of jobs were lost. The situations in the economy create particular situations which move either in this direction or in that direction. No one can say it was for the first time that we had this kind of a problem. I think, as I'm saying, there was overreaction. Well, for an informed uh, discussion on uh, that particular issue and more issues are to come. I'm joined here in the studio by Professor Sipo Siepe. Thanks very much for joining us, Prof. Thank you for inviting me. And of course, in our uh, um, Pretoria studio, I'm joined also by Professor Lesiba Tefu. Good evening, Prof, and thanks very much for joining us. Uh, good evening, Voyo, and good evening to Sipo. Well, I want us to start um, just on the back of that clip um, that you saw and heard there, Prof. Now, here is uh, a president who honestly believes, it would seem to me, yeah. that he's being punished for doing the right thing. Um, from what he was telling us, he believes that the BRICS Bank is something to take very seriously. And uh, there was no better man, certainly from where he sat, um, than uh, 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 Minister Nene to actually go and head the regional um, division of that bank. And there goes a market that uh, uh, like to punish him for doing the right thing, and he still does not understand it. 
Well, I think he sort of understands, and uh, he provides reasons why he wanted to do that. What is missing here is uh, his failure to realize that there were a number of stories that almost suggested that the people who are closer to him are being reckless with our economy. And uh, there was also a perception that had been created that uh, Minister Nene is the only person who has been able to stop those people who are associated with the president. And the, whether that is true or false, the perceptions have been generated for a number of weeks and probably months in our body politic. So the removal of Nene was seen in that light. So you could argue that it is unfair. But what we need to know is that uh, the markets work around the notion of familiarity. That if they say we are familiar with this person and this person seems to represent this perspective. But what the president is also correct is that uh, our economy was not doing well under Trevor Manuel, under Pravin, even under Nene. Actually, before he, Nene was removed, South Africa was downgraded. So we can't blame that decision to say it has affected, the, our economy was not doing well, we must accept that. But the, the president should have understood, and that's why some of us call it a, a major miscalculation, because there was an effect. But the mere fact that the president then changed his mind, there's something positive about it. First, it says you have a president who, when he errs, even when he says he does not err, but the, through persuasion, is willing to change his mind. What we should not have is the president who stubbornly clings, uh, stays on a course that everybody <coughs> else says is a disastrous course. So they change. So we can argue about uh, the, what he says, but the bo bottom line is that the president was forced to change his mind, and, and he, he did. did. And he did. Professor Tebu, your, Tebu, your take? Well, uh, I, I think uh, let's acknowledge that indeed. Uh, the economy wasn't doing well. But could we say that the decision precipitated the situation? The answer would be in the affirmative, uh, which means, therefore, um, things would not have been as they are right now or in the past three weeks had that decision not been taken. That's one. Two, the president supposedly changed his mind was it out of conviction or out of coercion? I think the latter is the case because um, that spiral down uh, economically was almost uh, uh, going to worsen the situation for all of us, including his own tenor in office. And something had to give. And indeed, I, I, I commend him for having ultimately uh, given in and taken a decision he did. But if it was a corrective measure, and indeed out of conviction, that, you see, it is important for me to express this view, that prior to the master stroke, the, 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 the preface was very positive. The appraisal of Nen was very positive, but the conclusion didn't resonate with the premises or the, or the preface. Uh, but nonetheless, a decision was taken, and we know what happened. It is unfortunate. Um, let's move on. Professor Yepe, how important, or was it important, um, for him um, to, 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 to put it out there that um, whatever people may have assumed about him and the reasons behind um, doing what he did, but also retracting that later. That was it important for him to put it out there that he his decision was not arrived at willy nilly. In other words, there was a logic to him deciding to take Minister Nene somewhere else, and but also even bringing on something new like uh, Minister Desmond van Royen was not misplaced. In other words, that too wasn't reckless. For he goes on to say that uh, if you look back, 
you know, at how far we've come or where we've come as a country. Mm -hmm. Look at Trevor Manuel. Look at all the ministers of finance that we've had recently. They too, including Nene, actually went to people who were grounded in finance or anything like that. And yet there was not there was no such an outcry. There was not the outcry that you've seen now. How important was that? Or was it important even? I think it's, it's important for him, but I don't know whether it's important for us. I think uh, what is important for us is that uh, correct steps were taken. But uh, what uh, is important for him is also to deal with this perception that you have a president who is reckless. So he simply says there was a logic there were reasons that informed me in approaching this. And uh, it is just unfortunate that, uh, unfortunately, those reasons that he gives do not address the perceptions that some people had. You just needed to look at uh, the coverage about SAA, the coverage about uh, ESCOM, coverage about... There was this impression that uh, the, the country is not in good hands in economically, but you also that there are some people who would want to go forward? And actually, the language that is used in our media without any evidence provided is that there are people who are busy looting. And uh, so when the, you have the language of looting, and you, you also have a presentation of a minister who's trying to prevent that, and you don't address that, that I'm not doing this because of this, then you have it. people who are going to say, you have a president who's reckless. And actually, most of the media, began to editorialize this matter in that language. So I think the president is trying to say, you are being un unfair to me. These are the, but uh, unfortunately, that can be a matter of debate. What is important is do we, uh, the steps that are correct that have been taken. But I can understand that if I'm in that position and I'm, I'm projected that way, I'll feel the need to explain myself. Professor Tefu, um, what lessons do you think um, our government um, has learned from this particular episode? Uh, I think, uh, look, if there has been adequate consultation, I think good advice would have been provided to the president. Possibly, even now, some would argue, why was uh, uh, Gordon removed as a, as a minister of finance in the first instance? and only to be uh, restored subsequent to the saga. Yeah. So it does suggest that indeed um, there were reasons to remove Kodo Gordon at the time he did, and some of us would argue he did a sterling job. If anything, he even into, went to into areas that are very few dead to go into. And he probably would have taken us a step further, especially red dealing with corruption, nepotism, and other ills that beset a, a government at, a, in all tiers or in all spheres. I think he had acquitted himself well. But the lessons learned in earlier is that do consult, especially the experts in the area, especially members of the organization. Remember, even the elders in the ruling party did concede that they were not consulted, suggesting that were they or had they been, they would have advised otherwise. And one doesn't want to cast any aspersion on the, the then Minister of Finance, Desmond, but only to say it didn't look like he was the popular choice. Neither does it seem like he acquitted himself well when he worked as a mayor or as, uh, as a mayor in one of the municipalities. So I think lessons have been learned. Consult, consult, especially those who have the expertise in finance and especially the elders in the organization because I think there is something called democratic centralism within the ruling party. Well, thanks very much, Prof. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we talk about another issue that uh, we got to uh, really discuss this week following once again uh, that interview that uh, the SABC had with uh, President Zuma at uh, the weekend. Mancosa, Southern Africa's leading distance learning institution. Accredited, affordable, 
and accessible management education programs, higher certificates, diplomas, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees. Register at Mancosa and be part of Southern Africa's leading private business school. Visit our website mancosa.co.za. Mancosa. Management education reimagined. The son of Africa, Trevor Noah, is leaving America in stitches. I never dreamed that I would one day have, well, two things really. Um, an indoor toilet <laughs> and, and a job as host of The Daily Show. We are the first to bring you the latest films around the globe. Dear white people, the minimum requirement of black friends needed to not seem racist has just been raised to two. Cobham's Esseco is a gifted blind musician, a master of soothing notes from the piano. I love to sit behind the piano. You know, that also helps me find inspiration. In the distance, in Join Rifula Mulwa every Friday for that one-hour weekly dose of art and entertainment news at 9 p.m. on Trends. Well, the issue of succession is upon us once again. That uh, following a call by the ANC's Women's League that uh, South Africa, the ANC and South Africa deserve a woman president this time around come the next elective conference of uh, the ruling party. Well, we had a conversation with uh, the Women's League president um, a week ago, and uh, she reiterated the call that uh, the Women's League is making once again. And in my interview with President um, um, Jacob Zuma at the weekend, I asked if, in fact, perhaps uh, the permutation of uh, who should be president uh, of uh, the ANC perhaps involves him in one way or the other. Here's what he had to say. All what I've said, I can't go for third term. That, uh, that is a point I've made. But that is, is a point we, we make as, my, as indiv an individual. The ANC decides on, on, on who must do what. That's not the individuals on their own to say, mm -mm. I just say because that is an approach that the ANC has followed so far. Wow. And as an ANC, that's what I've been saying. Well. Well, I think uh, the issue of a third term is a non-starter. Uh, it's uh, correct for the president to say he's not interested, but uh, th he should uh, be emphatic. He should not say it's uh, really up to the ANC, because uh, the ANC has consistently made that statement that they do not want people to overstay their welcome in office. And I think South Africans also would like that. T uh, two terms is sufficient for you to take us forward uh, or to mess up. So I don't think uh, uh, he should be dilatating. There was a time when he was so emphatic that there was no but to the question. So some of us would advise him to say stick with the position that uh, I'm going to serve f only two terms uh, and nothing more. And uh, not even try to influence who's going to be the next president. Because uh, what we also know is that uh, members of the ANC have taken a dim view to be sitting presidents or people who have been being in position to try to influence the next uh, persons who are going to take over. But we know that politicians like to hold on to power and they like to influence, but the, it is a very dangerous zone for him to move into. Professor Tevo? Yeah, I, I, had, I had someone say, the more things change, the more they, they remain the same. <laughs> it sounds like a familiar line to me, but, um, I'm more interested in hearing the comments of the victors of Polokwane in this instance, because it was this matter in particular that caused more pain to the then sitting president, Thabo Mbeki. And now I've heard in the past an unequivocal statements from the president saying, I am not available. 
right now is prevaricating and one would think it is not in interest nor in the interest of the organization because i know for sure that uh, there are those who are canvassing and campaigning especially the so-called premier league uh, one of them has been consistent in saying we must even align the anc presidency with the general elections which means the very least he would request would that the anc extends the president's term to align that term with which effectively says give him an extra two years right it, that in itself is also offensive and i would want to believe as sipo says that the best one can do is just to say unequivocal i am not available but remember if you ask the the, the protagonist the vanguards of polokwane they would tell you that the president said i'm only available to serve one term to serve one term now he is saving the second term could others say he wouldn't consider if we were to be approached again to succumb under sheer pressure and say i'm no longer available i think the best would be to say i am unequivocally unavailable i know what harm that has caused to the organizations and to those who plotted that route ahead of 20, uh, 2007 I'm glad you mentioned Polokwane because in the run-up to Polokwane at the NGC uh, that was held at the University um, of Pretoria in 2005, uh, I had a conversation with the then president of the ANC, Thabo Mbeki, and I asked him about this question, which of course was what opened um, the floodgates um, thereafter. Uh, here's how, just a clip from that particular interview. The, the South African constitution is essentially a, a product of the ANC because we're the majority party. There was no decision uh, that could have been taken without the ANC. And so you see that even in the instance that uh, we've got over two-thirds majority, we haven't touched the constitution, which we're not going to, because it's our constitution. And we, we put this matter deliberately there uh, of this two-term uh, to communicate a particular message to ourselves. Uh, to, we don't want professionalization of power so that people are prof I'm professionally a president for 50 years. It's out of order. And, and for the ANC, would you accept nomination for president of the ANC? Well, I mean, the first thing about that is, of course, that the ANC doesn't have such a limitation. And I, I think it's a... Again, I, I would really leave it as a matter that the ANC will have to sort out at the time. It, it really entirely depends uh, on the sense of comfort uh, among members of the ANC. It would clearly be very good if uh, we, we have succession, have younger people coming in and so on. And uh, uh, it's very good. It brings new blood, new ideas, new energy and so on. But as I say that, I, I think it would really be driven by what sense of comfort members of the ANC have. And if they're comfortable with you, you would take that opportunity? If they said so, if they said, well, we want you to continue, it's fine. Depends. Two and a half years, as I was saying, is a long, long way ahead, away. I might be too tired by then. Well, of course, two and a half years later, he was standing for that position, position in Polokwane, and we know what happened. Yeah, he was judged harshly by history. It was a serious humiliation. And it was that humiliation that also led to his recall. And remember also the conference also decided to say they would like to make sure that the position of the ANC president coincides with the, that of the head of state, precisely to try to limit that. So I think the ANC should stick uh, and be consistent on this matter and should uh, be sending a, a clear message that uh, they stand by what they said in 2007 and there should be no detailing around the issue. Professor Tefu, uh, one of the reasons I actually dug that clip um, is because this week we saw the first um, in a series, we are told, of uh, letters or publications or columns, whatever you call them, um, wherein 
former President Thabo Mbeki will be writing, responding to some of the things or clarifying issues that are out there in the public domain. I mean, a lot of people have read, have read a lot of things into that. And one of the things that they seem to be reading is that could he be you know, paving the way for what could be a comeback? I'm not sure of that one, Vuyo, but what I'm happy about is I'm happy for him in, in more ways than one. And I want to believe if he comes from my part of the world, I would say his ancestors are very strong. I'm happy that at least in his lifetime, uh, people could kneel uh, at his feet and say, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa for what we did to you in Polokwane. He must thank his God for that. And I think it assuages his conscience far pretty well. And uh, the humiliation suffered there. We know that it was engineered, manufactured, and uh, the protagonist, the protagonist ultimately went to him to apologize. And he was adult enough, mature enough to embrace them and say, it was all in the interest of the nation. I could have complicated matters by staying on, but at least he saw it a dignified way in the interest of the nation. Now, I, 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 but again, you listen to him speak, you listen to the sitting president speak, again, there is that sense, the desire somehow to continue. Yet at the same time, they advocate for observance and respect for tenor, for the time limits. You and I know that in other parts of the world, people would even change the constitution to extend their stay in power. But South Africa for now, with the constitution it has, with the uh, constitutional court and active civil society, I think that is not about to be done. Well, the CEO of the Tawambeki Foundation was asked as to whether, you know, what this could all um, mean, why he has decided um, to write and why, uh, and why now. Um, here's what... Uh, um, he, he had to say when he was asked by our reporter Aldrin Sampier why um, President Beke had decided to um, you know, do these, uh, write these uh, responses and why now. President Beke took a conscious decision that he would leave um, the responsibilities of political leadership and direction to those that are active in that space and he will not be um, delving into that space. Even now, he's, no, he's got no intention to do that, but he has the responsibility to correct this distortion. Well, um, one of the people who commented about you, the statement that it made is uh, Matthew Posser. And uh, from my side, I would argue that uh, it is good that he explains himself his thoughts, but there's also a history. And when you explain your thought when you, are out, when you are powerless, when you don't have power, it's different than when you explain yourself when you're in that position. And Matthew's response was very pointed, that he was shocked that the, the former president would uh, visit old wounds. Because uh, when people claim to have been implicated and implicate him, in that process and he did not speak and uh, the, you should imagine what happens to a person when you are said publicly that you are one of the people who wants to topple a sitting president it impairs you politically but if you're a businessman it also impairs you it would have been nicer for the president to have spoken then but you must also understand that you had you had people who were very hurt so what we might actually end up being, doing, is that in an attempt to try to get the number of perspectives, you are going to revisit those battles. Because uh, now those people like Matthew Posa and uh, Tokyo and Ramaphosa, at that time, they were weak, in a weak position. Today, they're no longer weak. They could not answer the president then. They just wished that uh, this lie that has been said about them goes, uh, goes away. But once you start opening that, as Posa says, we were wounded. Please don't go that route. So as he tries to correct the history, it must be done delicately so that uh, no new wars are fought.
prof. It may be good for him personally, and uh, his ancestors may well be with him, but it may just not be good for many other people. Old wounds may just be, you know, um, reignited. Well, uh, I would have expected, Tipo, just to put a... Uh, one clause or a footnote to his, his, his uh, input in this regard, namely that um, Honorable Steve Sweater, may soul rest in peace, did go out there to own up that it was not correct. Was that, was that not sufficient? Okay, that's fine. Let's leave it at that. It's a moot point. It can be contested. But I also want to believe that it is the right time for Becky to say exactly what he's saying. Because if he had said those then, again, it would be an at attempt at trying to distance himself from the plot as uh, purported, purportedly engineered by him. That's one. Now, now that he's out there, he's saying, let, his let history be understood also from my perspective. And the rest you can judge for yourself. And I think is the most ideal thing, and that's the right thing to be done. Tell the story as ought to be told, and let the people judge for themselves. I hear Matthew Potter's concerns. Yes, indeed, it might be opening wounds. But at the same time, perhaps it's better said than left unsaid and perpetuate the misunderstanding and the misconceptions. And indeed, the lies fabricated in an attempt and an endeavor to unseat him because there was a lot of unhappiness and several attempts were made and until until it culminated in what happened so he too is feeling in a in a way wounded and desirous of venting out and let the truth be known but is it not uh, professor Siepe, uh, is this not uh, uh, perhaps a lesson to our leaders that perhaps when things are happening you know or wrongs are being committed you have a responsibility to deal with them as and when they happen. Well, I was in a program where his spokesperson and I were discussing this matter. And most of the callers were raising that issue. Why now? Why didn't you say it when you were in power? Because at that time it had an effect on people. So we should not minimize, in as much as he has a right to say that, we must also not minimize the fact that there, there were people who were implicated and those people are not happy. And one of them has already come out. And they, we have no way of knowing how this will pan out. What we need to do, actually this is what we want the president, former presidents to do, is to say we, the country has challenges. How do we also move forward? Uh, to the, uh, you know, some, in other countries, people do wait until everything is settled. And then they can actually pan. But for as long as you have these people, please, what is important, talk to them. And then maybe if collectively you stand up there and you correct it, it will remove the sense of hurt, the sense of uh, being wounded. And they, then collectively you say you are correcting that. But to simply stand up there, it's almost like you want to rewrite history. But the history has already judged the president. The president was defeated politically and the president was recalled. Those are the facts of history. All other things are stories. For instance, he argues <coughs> that the Steve Chuete, after he announced that as a minister, he called him and berated him. We did not know that, but Steve Chuete is not there to say yes, whether it's true or false. So you can always write the story, but ultimately history is recorded by what happened. And what happened is that a president was recalled, a president was defeated politically, and there were a number of issues. So we, we can get into speculation, but I would rather Energy is spent, intellectually and otherwise, in developing this country and making sure that we move forward. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Prof, uh, we have less than a yes, minute, but yeah. I want you to take us back where we started. When I asked um, whether what uh, President Jacob Zuma did at the weekend, by reflecting on what had happened and giving his own reasons and explanations for what he did or for what had happened that he perhaps did, in my view, um, uh, the right thing. I want, you, I, want, I want you to take us back for what we are seeing now with President Mbeki, with what President Mbeki is doing, um, is that he is now taking back to an era that we had long forgotten about. But as Professor Siepe says, he may just, um, you know, uh, 
get old wounds to come back again and perhaps uh, certain things may come back to haunt him or other people that he may have been associated with. Which then brings me to the point, wasn't perhaps President Jacob Zuma right in acknowledging what he had done but also giving his own reasons for the record and this episode will now be forgotten but at the very least someone will know as to why he did what he did. Well, look, I think the, the, we, 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 the, I, I have to make this point that uh, I'm not sure if Mbeki was defeated politically. Because if you listened to what the people are saying today and the apologies made, and then you also are forced now to go and say, was he defeated by some elements within the party or by the party itself? And I will leave it at that, because that's when I say, ours is not a democracy, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quasi democracy. But he was voted out. Yeah, actually, remember, you see, time moves. And the, the, the president, the same President Mbeki, was, was voted in and also was voted out. Yeah. That is history. Let's not uh, debate that aspect. He, after Pulukwan, he was no longer the president of the ANC. And that was a political context. Do you want to finish your point, Prof? We've run out of time. No, 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 I, yes, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. Le let's leave it at that. It can assuage his concerns. I have no problem with that. I, I think what he cannot deny is, is that this is, ours is not a democracy in that sense of the word. Because if the people of South Africa were called upon, certainly Mbeki would have stayed on. Therefore, I'm calling for the amendment for the, of the Electoral Act so that the people of South Africa can elect their own president, lest a few people lead us into what we went into with possible catastrophe, only to apologize later. But that is fine. Let's go back to the main question. The main question you are asking me is, shouldn't he own up? Where he made, yes, where President Mbeki made, made mistakes, let him stand up and own up. I'm sure we are still going to hear more. And I'm sure he would be man enough to own up where he made mistakes. Equally, I commend uh, the, the sitting president, Jacob Zuma, for owning up for, for the mistakes made and for correcting where if and when called upon. And I would hope that as he moves on, um, yeah, he would ensure that at least mistakes that are so costly as the one we had are not repeated. Professor Tefu, Professor Sepia, thank you very much to both of you uh, for joining us in this conversation this evening. Well, you're watching On The Record. Do join us again next week on Monday. Mondays to Thursdays is when we have this program between 9 and 10 in the evening. For this week, it's a goodbye from me.